Hi everyone, I went back into the archives and found some of the first stories I translated on this channel. These stories go back to 2019, and the setup I had back then, it wasn't great. I hope you like these, and don't worry, I'll be back with new stories very soon. But in the meantime, I'd like to hear from you. It's time to do another viewer suggestion video. Please can you drop a comment with a theme for a story, and I'll pick a handful of them and go in search of stories related to that theme. So for example, if you said Last Train Home Stories, I would search Shuten, or something like that. Eki, I don't know. And then I'd find something to fit the suggestion. I'm interested in what you can come up with, to be honest. Unusual themes are welcome. Thanks for watching, everyone. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. A few years back, a bunch of friends and I went camping in Ibaraki during summer vacation. It was May and the weather was good. I'm going to call my friends A, B, and C, and myself was there, so there was four men in total. A, B, and C go to this camp basically every year, but it was my first time. I hadn't been camping with these guys before, but I was very excited to join them. They sold it to me well. They said that the beach was beautiful. They said that their is usually not that many people around the beach, so we can do whatever we feel like without others bothering us or annoying us. After coming off the National Highway 51 and going down a narrow road for a few hundred meters, we arrived at the beach. We saw a family camper van just by the entrance to the beach, so we decided to pitch up away from them by about 200 meters. By lunch, the beach was full of surfers, but by dinner time, they had all cleared off. The beach was empty, as far as the eye could see, except for that family camper van, just us and them. As there were no lights around, it was so quiet. I fell asleep way faster than usual. We all slept in the same tent. Three of the guys slept side by side, and I slept at the bottom of their feet, near the zipper of the tent. I woke up in the middle of the night with a desperate urge to use the bathroom. I thought I was gonna pee my pants. I checked the time and it was past 2 a.m. I have never been the type to be afraid of the dark or superstitious in any way. So that night, I was listening to the waves as I was getting up. It was very relaxing, but also kind of made me need to use the bathroom even more. The only problem was I heard another sound. It was clear and distinct, and it made me freeze in my sleeping bag. It was coming from no more than about five meters away, and it was a very strange sound. It was coming closer to our tent, from the weight and interval between each sound, I intuitively felt that it was footsteps. I couldn't see any light outside the tent. Walking along a sandy beach with no light? That's pretty strange. We were a good distance away from the family camper van. They would have no reason to be walking so close to our tent. Plus, I heard the footsteps coming from the opposite direction. Is this a person? It sounds like a person with its slow, deliberate steps. My head was spinning. I was sweating in the darkness of the tent. Even though I needed to use the bathroom, I didn't dare move a muscle. It was already too late. I could hear those footsteps circling our tent. They sounded like they were right outside, no more than 10 centimeters away. Whatever it was, started walking around our tent clockwise, just circling it. What the hell are you doing, I wondered. What do I do? I thought of trying to wake up one of my friends, but I didn't want to make a sound. I was too afraid to leave my sleeping bag. I fought the urge to go to the bathroom and just tried to stay as still as possible. I hoped and prayed that those footsteps would go away because intuitively I knew that they were bad. They were bad news. But things got worse. The footsteps continued circling clockwise, going around and around. Then something occasionally prodded the thin layer of fabric on our tent, like a hand testing for a weak point of entry. The metal poles supporting the tent began to creak and bend. It made such a horrible sound. I tried thinking of a song in my head, and I kept repeating the lyrics and the melody over and over, just trying to ignore what was happening outside the tent. Just ignore it, I told myself. Just ignore it and it will all go away. 
I closed my eyes tightly. It was bright outside my tent. I must have drifted off. I was so relieved, I ran out there to quickly pee. Idiotically forgetting about last night, I looked back at the tent and saw footprints. I will never understand this, but the footprints came from the sea and led back to the sea. I immediately woke my friends up and told them what had happened, and we decided to get the hell off of that beach. The next night we stayed in an area with lots of camper vans and other tourists. Last winter, my girlfriend and I had a huge argument while we were driving home late night in the mountainside. She kicked me out of the car and just left me there. I thought that she'd come back soon, but she didn't. And to top it off, I realized that my phone was in her car. It was the dead of night and not a single car passed by, so the only option I had was to walk. I was so annoyed. As I kind of knew this area, I decided to take a shortcut instead of the road my girlfriend and I drove up. The grass was long on this road, but I could tell that a car had driven down here recently. Some of the grass was flat. This shortcut probably doesn't get used all that much, so I found it a bit strange. It was a hard walk, it was cold, and I was kind of frightened. I wanted to quit, I just wanted to go home, it was horrible. It was the dead of night, and the hillside was dark, so dark that I couldn't really see where I was walking. But then I saw a light. A small family car was approaching. It was behind me, the bright light shining past me. It was warm on my back. Was it running out of gas? Well, whatever. For the time being, I thought I'd at least ask to borrow their phone. I stepped into the middle of the grass road and called out, Excuse me. I regretted this idea almost instantly. Without thought, I had plunged myself into potential danger. I had no idea who was in that car, or what they were doing in the mountainous woods so late at night. What's wrong? A woman's voice called out from the car. I explained the situation. I asked if I could borrow her phone. We're out of service area, she replied very calmly. With that said, I decided that I wanted to get the hell away from her. Well, I better get going then, I said while turning to leave. Please help me. By saying those few words, it ensured my escape was impossible. Help me dig a hole. If you help me just for a moment after we're done, I'll take you wherever you want to go. As she said this, her right hand was idly making scooping gestures above her head, as if to cover it. Swinging her hand in that pendulum style made me wonder, if I were to refuse, what might happen? I frantically dug a hole. While I was digging, the woman watched and talked to me. I can't remember most of the conversation. It doesn't make any difference now anyway. She seemed to like talking. She was asking me all kinds of questions about myself. I thought it would be a bad idea to give her correct answers, so I just kind of made stuff up as I went along. Finally, I finished digging the hole, and it was to her satisfaction. She went to her car and brought back a bag. I thought I was about to see a corpse, but I was wrong. The bag was overflowing with hair. Too much hair for one person. Ah, are you a hairdresser? I nervously asked, but there was no reply, just silence. It was terrifying. She brought lots of items from the car and threw them into the hole I dug. There were children's toys, clothes, etc. The last item was a cooler. I was terrified that there might be a child in there. My heart started pounding in my chest. By the end of it all, I didn't know what to think. She gave me a ride home, as promised, and it was all finished and done with. I began to forget about the incident over time, but this year, I found a paper bag in front of my house. I looked inside and it was full of hair. I remembered the incident on the mountain. I remembered the incident in the mountainous woods and I wondered if this could be a coincidence. Surely it had to be related. I decided to tell my good friend about the situation. My story certainly sparked his curiosity. Let's go back there and dig up what you two buried, he asked. 
to be honest, I want nothing to do with those bags of hair, I replied. But then he said, why don't you just tell me where the place is then? He kept asking and talking about it at work all the time. It got to the point where I ended up going with him, even though I really didn't want to. One day after work, we headed towards the mountain. He decided to invite another work friend too. We drove up the mountain road and there was a chain sectioning off the grass road I had walked down. My friend got out and unhooked it. The grass had grown a lot since last year. It bent beneath the wheels of the car. It was like we were surfing. I couldn't quite remember where the hole was since it was overgrown now. I thought because of this my friends would give up searching for the hole but nope. So I thought I'd say, oh, I think it was over here in the hope that we would dig and find nothing and then we would all be able to go home and never come back. But then it occurred to me that anyone would be able to notice the difference between a place that had been dug up. The grass would obviously be shorter and the soil would be a different color too. Here it is, my friend said with glee. And the other one confirmed it. Park up and shine the headlights in this direction. Let's dig this up fast, they shouted. I wanted to get home quickly, so I didn't protest. I just helped them. With the three of us men digging, we were able to unearth the things that that woman threw away very quickly. When I helped her bury all that stuff from her car before it was dark, I couldn't see it very well. There were a lot more things in the hole than I could remember. And there was the thing I was worried about the most. The cooler box. My friend wrenched it open. Black water splashed out. My friend dropped it and the black water all sloshed out onto the ground. What the hell, my friend said. Uh, I was expecting a body, my friend's friend said. This isn't a novel, this is reality, I told them. We filled the hole back in and went down the mountain. On the way back, my friend suddenly started to scream and shout about his hand feeling like it was burning. When he opened the cooler, the black water splashed on his hand. We all turned a ghastly pale. We rushed to the closest hospital. We didn't know what he had come in contact with. My friend got examined, and the doctor told us that he had suffered a corrosive burn to his hand. He got treated for it, and we were all relieved. But in the end, the mystery remains a mystery. Nothing was resolved. I guess that's the end of it. This happened about 10 years ago. I was a student at the time attending a local university while living alone. My apartment became a hangout for all my new friends. I usually left it unlocked since it wasn't uncommon to find my friends in my apartment when I got home. I know that it's a really dumb thing to do, but I grew up in the countryside and I was just used to it. I didn't care at the time. I remember that this happened in autumn. All the leaves were brown and it was starting to get colder at night. I was on my way home from my part-time job when I arrived at home and I found one of my friends asleep in my bed. I was pretty shocked and annoyed. I gave them permission to come and go as they pleased and I was happy to have people around. That was fine and all, but you can't sleep in my bed without my permission. That's just too much. That should be obvious, right? I have a sofa in my room for my friends to crash on. I never specifically said that that's where they should sleep, but come on, get a clue. Oh well, I thought. Don't let it annoy you too much, just let him sleep for a bit longer while I get the sofa bed set up and get ready for bed myself. I looked at my friend in the bed and he had all the covers pulled up way over his head. I couldn't make out which one of my friends it was, I could only see the top of their head. I started eating the dinner that I picked up from the convenience store and I yelled out different names asking, asking which one of my friends it was lying in my bed. No one replied to any of the names that I threw out there. There was no answer, so I got in the bath. Let him sleep a little bit longer until I kick him out of my bed, I thought. By the time I finished my bath, got dried and changed, my friend still hadn't moved. Oi, time to move now. I've set up the sofa bed. I want my bed back. Get out of my bed, bud. I said as I approached the bed. As I called out to him, my friend pulled his head all the way under the covers. Whatever I said, he just pulled the covers over his head more and more. He was acting very weird. He started violently tossing and turning in my bed. I stared at my bed for a while. Something didn't look right. 
You know the shape of a person in bed? This seemed a bit larger than one of my friends, you know? It was so weird, it was as if someone was hiding in my bed. None of my friends would do that unless they were playing a prank. I half expected them to jump out at me. But it kind of gone past the point where there was going to be a punchline or an end to the prank. It had gone on too long. I called out my friends' names again. No response. This wasn't a prank. I started to get anxious. My hands began to tremble. I felt a strange new sense of fear that I hadn't experienced before or since. My lower back went ice cold. I summoned up the courage to confront whoever was there. Hey, why aren't you saying anything? A part of me still believed. My friend was there, a very small part of me. At the moment I drew closer to the bed, I heard the same moving sounds beneath the covers. I wanted to scream, but no sound came out. This time I saw the forehead and eyes of the person in the bed slowly emerge from the covers. The eyes, they glared at me. They were wide and filled with hate. They burned. They were staring straight at me. I'll never forget those eyes. I felt faint. I knew, as I stared into those eyes, that they did not belong to any of my friends. I wasn't even sure that they looked human. After that, I can't remember much at all. I just remember being in an absolute state at the local convenience store on the phone to my friend. One of my friends rushed to the convenience store to join me. We called all our friends to make sure it wasn't any of them. No one owned up to it. Who the hell was in my bed? I always make sure to lock my doors and windows now. I shudder when I think about how long I was alone in the same apartment as that person and how vulnerable I was without knowing. This happened when four friends and I were camping one night. A typhoon was approaching Japan. The weather forecasted stated that it wasn't on course to our campsite, but then it had changed direction, so we were forced to check into a guest house. It wasn't raining, but our tents wouldn't be able to withstand the strong typhoon winds. We approached the guest house. The building was magnificent. We were all welcomed in by the cheerful owners. It was really great. They guided us to our room. It was opposite the hotel's banquet hall. We don't often use this room, but it might get a little noisy tonight, the owner said in a hushed voice. I'm sorry. I hope it doesn't ruin your stay with us. My friends and I went into our room and settled down. We ate and drank some of the food and alcohol we had packed for our trip. We could hear some noise coming from next door. The party in the banquet hall never had got as loud as we were led to believe that it might. After eating and drinking a little, I decided to go and look around the guest house, since it was a really nice place. I walked past the banquet hall and I noticed something. The lights were all off, I could tell by looking under the door, but I could hear voices murmuring and whispering in there. I went back to our room and I told my friends about what I had heard. They followed me and stood outside the banquet hall, just as I had, and they listened. They could hear it too. Maybe there's ghosts in there, one of my friends said. We weren't scared, but the more we drank, the more curious we grew. Later, one of my friends knocked the wall of the banquet hall and asked, Did someone die in there? And then, bang, something banged on the wall from inside the banquet hall to indicate yes, we all assumed. Should we light an incense stick for you? One of my friends asked aloud. Bang. Another thud against the wall. How many should we light? How many of you are in there? She asked. It was silent for a moment, and then there was multiple banging. Too many in number to count. We all froze in fear. I can't really remember anything after that. I guess I could blame it on the alcohol, but I woke up in bed, and as soon as I got up, I ran out into the hallway. The owner's wife was walking towards me in a beautiful kimono. She had a huge bundle of incense sticks in her hand. She paused and smiled and said to me, You heard it then. And I nodded. 
She told me that a long time ago, there was a terrible typhoon which claimed many victims in this village. We had to use the banquet hall as a makeshift morgue until help arrived, she said. Now and then, they wish to make contact with our guests. I think they must have liked you. This happened when I lived in a two-story apartment. The building was about 30 years old. It was in a great location, right by the train station, and the rent was cheaper than all the other buildings in town. Naturally, the living conditions were poor, and the other residents weren't exactly high society. There was an old man who seemed to spend every waking moment coughing or clearing his throat. And there was a foreign couple who were fighting all hours of the night in a language I didn't understand. As for me, back then I was young, and only working part-time, so I didn't have all that much of an income. Something strange started happening, though. It wasn't big to begin with. I remember thinking one day, I'm sure I didn't take the garbage out, but the bin was empty. Seriously, was someone stealing my garbage? I asked myself, and I realized how dumb that sounded, so I put it to the back of my mind. But when it happened again, I was a little concerned, to say the least. Who is throwing out the garbage, and why would someone do that? It was weird, but not actually that much of an inconvenience. I only started to get really spooked out when some of my underwear went missing. And then a couple of days later, something else happened. The dirty dishes in my sink were washed. And I definitely remember not doing that. It was really weird. I questioned my own power of recollection at that point. One day I came home from work earlier than usual because I wasn't feeling very well. I unlocked my door and that's when I saw her. There was a woman sat at the kitchen table, licking a pair of my chopsticks. I was so shocked that I left the apartment without saying a word. One of my neighbors called the police for me. They arrived pretty quickly. I explained what had happened, and they went to investigate my apartment while I waited outside. I heard the woman scream, and then after a few moments, she was brought out. She was clearly under arrest. The next day, the police called to let me know what had happened. The woman that they had arrested was my next door neighbor. She lived alone next door. I was told that she was suffering from mental illness and is now in hospital. Because the apartment is so old, she had found a way to climb in to my apartment through the adjoining wall. She would stand on her wardrobe, push a panel aside and climb through into my apartment. She told the police that the reason she did it was because she was in love with me. I found this so hard to believe since the first time I had laid the eyes on her was when she was being arrested. She had long dark hair and she was very skinny. She really creeped me out. The officer told me that it would be best if I moved as they couldn't arrest her on account of her mental disorder. It worried me that she might come back one day. Luckily, a friend let me stay with him. I went back to my apartment to quickly box up my belongings. About half a year later, when I finally got to sorting out some of my stuff from the boxes I packed up before I left, I came across an old photo album. I flipped through it for nostalgia's sake, and I felt a chill run up my spine when I found that my creepy neighbor had cut my sister out of a photo and put her own photo in its place. It was a photo of me with my arm around my sister, but now all I could see was her dark eyes staring at me. It was summer break at university. I decided to drive back home to Tohoku. Things were fine until the car broke down about 30 minutes away from my hometown. My car was old and I didn't know if it could be repaired. I managed to park my car on a back street close to a mountain pass. It was late at night so luckily the road was empty. I didn't see any cars so I chose to stop there. I pulled my smartphone out of my pocket thinking I could get some help from friends or family in my hometown 
but my battery was dead. My bad luck was piling up. With no other option, I decided to walk along the mountain pass in search of a payphone. The worst possible outcome would be I'd walk a few hours and reach my hometown. After about 10 minutes of walking up the steep pass, I was thirsty, I was out of breath, and my shirt clung to my body. It was wet with sweat. It was summer, and the summer nights can be pretty hot in Japan. I cursed myself for my lack of exercise. After a while, I saw a faint glow by the side of the road. A phone booth. Why would there be a phone booth on a mountain road anyway? Does it ever get used, I wondered? Just for a moment I was suspicious, but the joy of finding a means of communication on this desolate pass was greater than my initial doubt. I rushed to the phone booth and dialed my parents' number. Luckily I had plenty of change on me. The phone rang for a while, and then someone picked up. Hey, it's me, I said. But there was no reply. There was just this static sound, you know, that kind of kind of noise. My car broke down on the way, can you hear me? I could only hear that static noise again. I guess the payphone was busted. I had enough of it. I went to put the phone back on the hook when I heard a voice say, I'll be there soon. And then the phone line was abruptly cut. Who did I speak to? Because it was a woman's voice. I guessed that it was either my sister or my mum. I thought about it further. I didn't say where I was, so it felt strange that my sister or mum said that they'd be there soon. A gust of wind shook some nearby trees that sounded like murmuring. It creeped me out a bit, so I decided to head back to the car. I realized that I was on a dark mountain road in the middle of nowhere with this oddly placed phone booth. I was alone in this suspicious place, and I got goosebumps. It felt like someone was watching me, hidden in the darkness of the woods. I'll be there soon. The voice of the woman I heard on the phone danced around my mind. It didn't feel right. I could see my car, so I rushed to it. I got in and I locked all the doors. My heart was beating through my chest. I stared ahead through the windshield, hoping that something or someone wouldn't appear out of the darkness. It was all too much. I felt like such a target, so I shut my eyes. I didn't want to see anything at all. I don't know how long I stayed like that. But then I heard a knock come from the driver's side window. Whatever you do, don't look, don't look, I told myself. I had really worked myself up. I couldn't fight the urge any longer, so I opened my eyes slightly to take a sneak peek. Bright light filled my eyes. Was it morning? But it was night when I shut my eyes. The person who knocked my window was still stood there. He was a middle-aged, sunburned man. I could see his mini-truck behind him. He was saying something, so I opened my window. You are right, son? It looks like uh, you were in pain, but I guess you were just sleeping. I thought, you know, something bad had happened to you. Was I asleep? I don't even remember being tired. I replied to him. Sorry, the truth is my car broke down. Can I please borrow your phone? He was such a decent guy, he not only allowed me to borrow his phone, but he bought me breakfast and introduced me to a car mechanic friend of his. With my car repaired by noon, I managed to get to my parents' house safely. While relaxing at my parents' house, I thought back to what happened last night. I wondered if it was a figment of my imagination. Did I imagine the voice on the phone and then just fall asleep in my car out of exhaustion? I guess that's the most logical explanation. I didn't give it much thought after that. My phone buzzed. It was fully charged now. I checked it and gasped. I couldn't believe my eyes. The call history. 506 missed calls. All from a payphone. Have you ever had a ringing in your ears? I read somewhere that it could be a sign that something is about to happen, like a premonition of sorts. Since I read this, I've always regarded tinnitus as that. Whenever I have tinnitus, I always stop, look around me and remain alert. It's become a habit of mine. I work in a mall. When I finish work, I usually go shopping. This happened to me after work at about 8pm. 
I had a few errands to run, so I got in the elevator and went down to the third floor of the mall. The hallway is T-shaped from the elevator doors, so you have to walk straight for a bit and then you can either go left or right. Just when I got off the elevator, the ringing in my ears began. The painful feeling was back, as well as my own apprehension while exiting the elevator. I did my usual routine. I stopped, remained alert, and looked around. At the end of the hallway on the right-hand side, a knife held by someone unseen was deliberately being poked out from behind the corner. I was terrified since I was completely alone. I panicked and ran into a shop next to the elevator to take refuge. I rambled apologies and gave them an explanation for bursting in. I knew someone was out there. My stomach churned as I called the police. By the time the police arrived, the guy was gone. But they checked the security cameras and found some footage of a man holding a knife hiding behind the corner. The incident shook me to my core. It seemed like the man just wandered into the building holding a knife. When he got to the T-shaped hallway, he started darting about like a trapped animal, and then he hid behind the corner as he heard the elevator approaching. Then when no one came his way, he wandered back out of the building. After that, the man just blended into the crowd and was untraceable. He didn't act crazed or angry. The police were convinced that he hadn't committed a crime either. Why? What did he want to do? Was there something about my presence? I don't know him, and I doubt he knows me. There was a guy who walked in holding a knife, and apparently he's fine to go back out into public. It completely happened by fate. Fate. It has no rules. It does what it pleases. I was saved by my habit that day. Whenever I think back to it, I shudder. If I didn't stop to check my surroundings like I always do when tinnitus hits me, I would have walked right into the strange man wielding his knife's path, and who knows what he would have done. After work, I went shopping at my local shopping mall. I think it was around 8 p.m. The stores were really small and there wasn't much choice, but this mall was convenient for everyday items. I often shopped there. It was six stories high and the fifth and sixth floors were car parks. The mall itself was from the first floor to the fourth floor. There was also a basement floor. When this happened, the basement floor was being renovated. Therefore, it was off limits to the general public. The mall closes at 9 p.m. And by the time I got there, the staff were beginning to close their individual shops. I finished shopping on the fourth floor, and I didn't want to keep the staff waiting, so I hurried towards the exit. I hurried towards the elevators since the escalators had already stopped. I got into the elevator and pushed the button for the first floor. I had used the elevator before. It's very stuffy in there, and there isn't a window to look out of either. It makes me feel kind of claustrophobic. It was poorly lit, and the noise of the elevator was loud and on the back wall of the elevator was a huge mirror. It's kind of uncomfortable to be in there, to be honest. When the elevator began its descent, I looked at the button panel. The first floor button wasn't lit up, but the basement floor button was. I must have pressed the wrong button, I thought, but even when I pressed the button for the first floor, it didn't light up. It felt like the elevator was speeding up. The mechanical sounds grew louder. Finally, it came to a stop at the basement floor. I could see renovation work in place. A sign read, no public access, when the doors slowly opened. All the lights were off as it was under construction. I could hardly see a thing. The only source of light was the green lights above emergency exits. No one was down there, no construction workers or mall staff. It was just a wide, spacious, open floor. It was creepy. I wanted to get out of there, so I quickly pressed the button for the first floor. As the doors slowly closed, something came into view. I couldn't make out what it was, as my eyes had not adjusted to the darkness, but it seemed like someone was running towards the elevator to make it before the doors closed. So I hit the door open button, but then my eyes adjusted to the darkness, and I could see what was coming a bit clearer. I could see the person's silhouette better. He must have been over six foot six. He was very thin, tall, and his head was small. I realized why this figure looked so strange. 
He was running with both of his hands behind his back. His body was twisting and turning with each step. It looked like he would fall down any moment, and he was heading directly at me. I was terrified. I quickly hit the door close button. He was getting closer and closer, his body twisting and writhing. I repeatedly hit the door close button. Finally, the door began to slowly close. The green exit light above the elevator illuminated him a bit. He had no hair on his head. I couldn't see very well because I was panicking at the time, but I remember that he was barefoot too. Even after the door closed, I continued to press the button repeatedly like an idiot. The elevator didn't move at first because I hadn't pressed any floor buttons. I was confused and frightened. When I finally pressed the first floor button, I heard a huge bang strike the outside of the elevator doors. The force was so strong that it shook the whole elevator. The elevator arrived at the first floor and I sprinted out of the mall. I called my boyfriend immediately and I asked him to pick me up. I have no clue what the hell went on down there in the basement of the mall.